Good, good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's webinar entitled Mental Health and Burnout in the Pandemic. Name it, frame it, and tame it. I'm Nora Tarot, and I'm pleased to be moderating today's webinar along with my co-moderators, uh, Dr. Kimberly Brown and Dr. Ryan Cork. Um, today's webinar is being recorded and it will be available on the ASLD COVID-19 resources page, which um, I'm hoping if you've not visited before, you will visit. Um, in addition to this webinar, the COVID-19 Clinical Oversight and Education Subcommittee has produced a resource document to help medical providers with the feelings of stress and burnout. And at the end of this presentation, there will be a direct link to those resources. Um, and it is gonna be found also on the ASLD COVID-19 resource page, um, which we'll also provide to you uh, in the context of this webinar. Um, as you can see, this webinar is being brought to you by AASLD. Uh, ASLD has over 6,000 members. And it's those members that have been instrumental in bringing exceptional educational content such as the webinar tonight. And I invite you to join us. You as a member can play a, a vital role in bringing liver disease and treatment to the forefront and to help us in, in new challenges as they arrive, as has been the case with COVID-19. Um, so you can learn more about the ASLD on the website at aasld.org. The next slide, please. So let me introduce you uh, the co-moderators. Co co First, Kimberly Brown is the Chief of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at the Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit. Next slide. And uh, my other co-moderator is Ryan Kwok. <laughs> Sorry, Ryan, I actually didn't do a very good job on the first round there. Um, but uh, Ryan has been instrumental also in helping um, us to put together this um, a webinar. He's an assistant professor of medicine um, at the University of Bethesda and also is the pro uh, associate program director for the gastroenterology and hepatology fellowship program um, at the National Capital Consortium in, in Washington, DC. Next, please. Uh, and that's myself, I'm uh, Nora Tarot. I'm at the University of Southern California. Uh, I'm also a counselor on the AASLD. And um, I'm gonna share with you the webinar agenda for today. Um, as you can see, we have an outstanding set of speakers um, that are gonna take us through the name it, frame it, and tame it. And then at the end, we will have time for a panel discussion uh, where we will be um, taking questions uh, from uh, attendees um, and, and uh, posing them to our panelists. Um, you're encouraged to uh, submit questions. Um, if you could just take me to the next slide. Thank you. So you can submit your questions anytime during the webinar. There's um, the location of the Q&A at the top of or bottom of your screen, so look for it. You could submit that it, them at any time. Um, we are gonna answer them at the end of the presentations. Um, and just so you're aware, we will not be taking any verbal questions during today's webinar. So please do take advantage of the Q&A function. Next slide. So let me take a moment to introduce uh, our speakers. So we're very, very excited and pleased to have really an outstanding uh, guest list uh, of individuals who are joining us. The first is Dr. Marwan Abuja. Oh, Abu Jold. You know, I'm, I'm having a little trouble with my pronunciations today. Um, he's the director of the Transplant Institute um, at uh, Henry Ford in Detroit, Michigan. Um, he also holds the Benson, Benson Ford Chair of Transplantation and importantly is also president of the American Society of Transplant Surgeons. And, and he has uh, been interested and, and contributed to this area of uh, burnout for long before COVID um, has published extensively on burnout in transplant providers, uh, particularly uh, transplant surgeons um, and um, other physicians, and so brings his expertise to this topic uh, today. Next. Uh, the second presenter is uh, Dr. Susan Bailey, who's president of the American um, Medical Association. She's a distinguished allergist and immunologist who uh, practices in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, she assumed uh, her presidency uh, for the AMA in June of last year and in her inaugural 
uh, address. She actually highlighted the importance of physician burnout as a problem and one that would be made more acute and was being made more acute by COVID-19. So we're extremely excited to have her. She's a fierce advocate for physician uh, autonomy as well as well-being. Next. And then finally, um, Dr. Richards Summers is joining us. Um, and again, uh, as another member of our very distinguished um, speakers today, he's a senior residency advisor and clinical professor of psychiatry um, at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of uh, Pennsylvania, uh, very active in the American Psychiatric Association. He's a very um, well um, recognized educator, clinician, and author in the area of, 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 of burnout, has written on combating burnout and um, physician well being. So, as you can see, we have a really an outstanding group of speakers to address the topics of. Um, of name it, uh, frame it, and tame it. Next, please. Um, for the uh, question and answer period, we're also very pleased to have uh, two additional individuals join us as panelists. The first is Dr. Lisa McLean. She's the Director of F Physician Wellness at the um, Henry Ford uh, Health Center in Detroit. Next slide. And Marwa uh, Abdallah, who's a clinical cardiologist and intensivist um, and an assistant prof professor of medicine at Columbia University, um, and really has some uh, frontline experience to share with us related to the COVID-19. So we're uh, really delighted to have all of these individuals join us for uh, today's uh, webinar. Next, please. So uh, without any further ado, as they say, I'd like to introduce our first speaker who's gonna be addressing burnout. This is the name it, uh, burnout epidemic before the pandemic. And again, um, want to introduce Dr. Marwan Abdul-Jul, who's um, at the Henry Ford Transplant Institute. Thank you, uh, Nora, for the kind introduction. And uh, I wanna thank the ASLD and organizers for inviting me to participate in this much needed webinar. And it's such uh, a pleasure to be in company of such esteemed colleagues with an interest in that topic. Next, please. I have no relevant financial relationships to disclose. Next. So we've all lived through an unprecedented time in our history with the COVID-19 pandemic. And certainly in our organizations in Detroit here, which was an epicenter for COVID, we've seen mortality like uh, never in our lifetime with the United States now clocking over 500,000 deaths and nearly 30 million cases. And with many faces that we've seen or encountered or people who are now staff or relatives who have lost significant others, it all brought it home to all of us. Next, please. At the same time, we've seen remarkable courage heroism and sacrifice from our frontline staff, healthcare workers, and other people in the community that came to the rescue and helped with this pandemic. And that's what I call moments of inspiration in times of crisis. We've all seen colleagues, and this is Tom Cato, transplant surgeon at Columbia, whom I know well, suffered from COVID, was on ECMO, and lived to talk, talk about it, and continues to suffer from the long-term consequences. Next, please. So we all enter medicine and for many reasons, although most of us are in awe of medicine and are driven by this passion, the passion to heal and the patient to make people feel better. We thrive on those healing relationships and the humanism that is provided in front of us. We experience joy, especially in personal and professional settings and we derive that satisfaction on a daily basis. However, many of us are living through a lot of unhappiness around us or within us which is in stark, stark contrast to the sense of joy and vocation that called many of us into medicine and surgery. Next. Next, please. So this comes the, the syndrome of uh, burnout, the phenomenon of burnout. Next. So I apologize, can you back up? Yeah, well, I apologize for some reason the screen here is not popping up. This burnout phenomenon here, this slide is supposed to highlight the work of Herbert Freudenberger, who was a psychologist of German origin. He popularized the term in the 70s and 80s. In one of his uh, uh, books, he describes it as a state of uh, fatigue and exhaustion, mental and physical, that is brought about by the environment that you're in and the amount of effort you put in without having the rewards that come along with it. 
Next, please. So his work was mostly descriptive. Uh, however, it became more scientific when the rigor of science was brought by, and structure was brought by Christina Maslach and her group when she developed the maslach bernard model and then structured it in a fashion that we can measure it and, and evaluate it. She put it into four, three categories. First is emotional exhaustion, which most of us kind of, kind of associate with and understand. It's due to excessive psychological and emotional demands, leaving one feeling drained, depleted, give, having given all you could, you can't even get on with the day. Depersonalization is the other scale where there is a tendency to view others in an excessively detached manner where you're more cynical, you're losing empathy, and you're losing that connection. And then the third one is the low sense of low personal accomplishment, where you have negative self-perception, you're unhappy with your self-image, and you just do not appreciate the work that you do, and you lack confidence as well. Next, please. So the WHO has put the burnout into the ICD-10 the ICD classification and now updated ICD-11. Important things to extract from the WHO classification is that it was conceptualized as resulting from chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. And that's an important distinction. This is not a disease of an individual. This is something that results from workplace stress. And it should not be applied to describe experiences in other areas of life. And they also use the three sub, uh, uh, subcategories that the Maslach has used. Next, please. So how do we measure it? Maslach has put out the Maslach Burnout Inventory and has been validated in numerous studies with extensive literature. And for our own interest, she has the Health Services Survey. And what we often use is the medical personnel uh, uh, version of that. It's a 22-item survey that one can do in 15 minutes with the three subscales that they described earlier. And it goes on a, say, a scale of zero to six from never to every day to describe the frequency of the experiences you have. It is scored into three tiers, the low and the middle and the high, based on normative distribution within populations that are to which it compared from within that same discipline. So a high degree of burnout is someone who's it has scores that are high in the emotional exhaustion and depersonalization and low in the sense of personal accomplishment. And quite often the reverse of that burnout is classified as engagement. When you have very high level of engagement, you have low levels of burnout. Next, please. So the burnout, some people have viewed it that uh, it is a challenge to complete because it may be very long. And especially when you add uh, additional surveys to correlate it with uh, work-related components, uh, the team at uh, Mayo, at the HNF Field, the Lottie Derby, and others put this remarkable work together with the Physician Well-Being Index. This is something that many organizations have adopted. It's a validated tool. And the beauty of that work is that you have an abbreviated scale to which you can compare the normative population and have an action plan that you can utilize and give you a sense of direction. It stratifies the well-being with the mental quality of life, fatigue, and suicidal ideation. And it also identifies physicians with a, a certain degree of stress that would negatively impact their practice, whether it's career satisfaction, the intent to leave the current position, or committing medical error. And added to that is meaning in work and work-life integration. And the nice thing about this survey and the index is used in different classes of individuals within organizations, your trend, and our wellness director, uh, Lisa McLean, uses this extensively to shape interventions. Next, please. So what's, what's the national landscape look like? This is a good paper by Tate Chenefold where he looked at the data using the Maslach burnout inventory with physicians from 2011, 2014, and 2017. And in essence, burnout, the way it's classified with at least one symptom of burnout within that scale is about 44%. And 43% had favorable work-life integration, which means in the reverse, you had people who had unfavorable work-life integration over 50%. When looking 2017 versus 2011, you see burnout being the same, relatively speaking, with a brief period of change in 2014, work-life integration being worse than in 2017 than 2011. Obviously, the specialties here are outlined. There are some specialties that tend to always bubble to the top and some specialties that go to the bottom, and we seem to have some consistency in that space. Next, please. Back one, one more. Next. 
Okay, so what are the burnout drivers? I will go very briefly here. We often are described to being the canaries in the coal mine. So work overload, work environment, regulatory pressures, the EMRs and inefficiencies at work causing us to be pushed in that burnout direction. Sense of lack of support and absence of fairness in the work environment, whether it's compensation or acknowledgement of the work that is being done, and a lack of control of the barrage of working regulations and demands that come in your direction. The absence of work-life integration, adding to that the moral distress and moral injury we encounter with complex situations at work and patients in the environment, especially COVID now, and having to make conflicting decisions. A sense of breakdown and of community, wherever you work, where you spend most of your wake hours, leading to decrease in meaning and purpose. And also having insufficient rewards. It used to be intrinsic rewards where the drivers, it's no longer enough. And you're presenting with conflicts and values in the context of COVID, you're prioritizing resources, who will live and who will die. Next, please. So what happened with the COVID pandemic? So this slide, again, is not showing. Can you try clicking again, see if that shows up? Okay, back, okay. So this slide is not showing the COVID pandemic. In essence, and with the COVID pandemic, what we've all experienced is an exaggeration and increase in the burnout symptoms that we have seen before. In addition to that, however, there is a sense of ambiguity, a sense of uncertainty, in addition to social isolation. And with the stresses and the moral distress that we encounter, there has been increased anxiety, increased insomnia, increased in depression, increased in PTSD, uh, all of which exacerbated burnout symptoms. And in some areas reported well over 50% burnout, anxiety, depression, and PTSD resulting from the COVID pandemic. In addition to that, it's redefining our purpose, redefining how we look at life and how we look at work. Next, please. <clears throat> so the COVID pandemic, this is a survey that came out from uh, also the uh, Wellbeing Index, looked at the level of distress with increased work, Certainly the nurses and employees at the front line have experienced the highest level of uh, distress with this, but certainly it's been also high among physicians and students and junior faculty, especially, and our other mid-level or advanced practice providers, I should say. So significant increase in distress in the COVID context. Next, please. So I would stop there and I wanna thank people for this opportunity. I will not take time from other speakers and I will pass on the mic back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marwan. That was a, an excellent introduction. Uh, we now uh, can name burnout, uh, which was uh, the goal. And, uh, and now we will move on to Dr. Bailey, president of the American Medical Association to talk about mental health and burnout in the COVID-19 era and really help us frame this discussion. Dr. Bailey. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me to join you today. Um, and for your attention to physician burnout and mental health, um, I also have no financial uh, interest to disclose. Now, we've talked about physician and provider burnout. Of course, it's been a growing concern for decades and really had reached crisis levels long before COVID-19. And in fact, the American Medical Association labeled burnout a public health crisis back in 2017 because of increasing numbers of physicians who were reported experiencing its symptoms and because of its profound impact on patient care, which of course is the focus of today's discussion. Next slide, please. Before I get to that though, I also want to quickly extend my sincere thank you and gratitude to physicians, nurses and healthcare providers across the country for their remarkable and tireless work in this pandemic. Uh, this is an image from Times Square from last spring. It has been an extraordinary time and this work has come at great personal risk to ourselves and our loved ones. Many in our healthcare community have died since the beginning of the pandemic. Many more have fallen dangerously ill. And whether you're a physician on the front lines in the ICU or just trying to keep your practice afloat under the severe economic downturn, almost everyone has experienced hardship in this pandemic. So that has been a major focus of our work at the AMA over the past year, 
and will remain so for as long as it takes. But thanks again, we cannot thank our healthcare heroes enough. Next slide, please. So um, Dr. Abulju talked about what COVID, what burnout looked like before the pandemic and, and these numbers, uh, which came from the AMA's last major study on the topic three years ago, really tell the story. Uh, about 44% of physicians across every state and every specialty reported at least one symptom of burnout um, as defined by the MBI uh, in the year prior to our survey. Why? Because our jobs are increasingly filled with paperwork and administrative hassles that get in the way of what we want to be doing, working with our patients. Uh, physicians spend two hours um, doing administrative tasks and typing on our EHRs for every one hour we spent with patients. And so that imbalance is the reason why one in five of our physician colleagues has considered reducing their clinical hours or leaving the profession outright. And of course, COVID-19 has made all these problems more acute. Next slide, please. As physicians, we wear many hats in service to our patients. Each of us is a healer, a scientist, communicator, advocate, researcher, scholar, problem solver, and even more. But especially at a time like this, it's important to remember that we're also human and we are subject to the same intense feelings of fatigue, anxiety, self-doubt, and depression that can arise in periods of extreme stress. So just as COVID-19 has devastated the lives of our patients, it has jeopardized our own safety and punctured the aura of invincibility that so many of us feel or used to feel. We worry that we have enough PPE to keep ourselves and our loved ones safe. We worry about the financial constraints on our practices and whether we'll have to lay off staff. We worry if we're giving our patients all the time and attention they really need. So it's not surprising that many of us are suffering mental and phys physical exhaustion during the pandemic. Every day we walk a delicate balance of service to our patients while also fearing that we might contract the virus and spread it to our coworkers, our families and our friends. That fear is lessening with vaccines, but it's still there. The pandemic has also triggered a host of other challenges by imposing the need for physical isolation, reducing access to some in-person community support systems and resources and limiting the opportunities to receive counseling. Next slide, please. Recognizing burnout and stress in our colleagues can be challenging. People experience stress and anxiety differently, so the outward signs can be difficult to see. But generally speaking, physicians and healthcare providers are happy. We're upbeat, we're inquisitive, we're very engaged in our work. We're passionate about what we do. But under times of extreme stress and anxiety, there can be noticeable changes in mood. Our colleagues can appear rushed or indifferent about their work. They may not express this in words, but their body language and mood can suggest that feeling nothing that they do makes a difference. And they may display other signs of despair, hopelessness and isolation, like less eye contact than usual, asking fewer questions, a feeling of depersonalization and of course, fatigue. So it's important that we pay attention to our colleagues for changes in mood and behavior. That's more than just having a bad day. We all have bad days from time to time. This last year, we've had lots of them, but there's a big difference between being tired at work after a long day and being tired by your profession. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Many studies have tried to quantify the impact of, patient, of physician burnout on patient care, and it's challenging to come up with a specific figure. Some studies, like one that was published in our own JAMA Internal Medicine in 2018, correlated physician burnout and satisfaction with a twofold increase in unsafe patient care and other troubling trends. 
Now, I'll be honest, this study was later retracted because of errors in the data, which actually underscores the difficulty in making direct connections between burnout and patient outcomes. But physician burnout does generally result in a loss of focus in patients, depersonalization, a lack of professionalism, an increased risk of safety and reduced patient satisfaction. Now, our AMA also has two ongoing surveys to assist healthcare systems and practices measure and monitor the impact of COVID-19 on frontline staff. We know from studies and from experience that physicians are more likely to consult our colleagues and peers for support and advice when we're dealing with job-related stress, as opposed to seeking out advice from behavioral health professionals that we might not know. One factor is the emphasis placed on physical stamina and mental toughness in medical school and residency. Another factor is just the overall stigma that anyone, but especially physicians can face if they seek outside help to manage their mental health. Doing so in some states, as we know, can actually jeopardize our medical licenses. Next slide, please. So how do we address this? Well, by delivering tools and support for physicians in the short term, and advocating for systemic changes in our health system in the long term. Both are priorities and areas of focus for the AMA. Next slide, please. For physicians and healthcare personnel who are experiencing undue stress and burnout that they attribute to this pandemic, there are a few simple measures we can take. First, we have to remember that it's okay to feel our feelings. Experiencing stress and the feelings associated with it are by no means a sign of weakness or a reflection on your ability to do your job. Secondly, employ healthy coping strategies. Put into practice strategies that might have worked for you in the past during times of stress. Some of these are getting enough rest, finding respite time during work or between shifts, remembering to eat meals on a schedule, getting enough fluids, engaging in physical activity and staying in contact with appropriate social distancing, of course, with family and friends. Third, do regular check-ins with yourself. Monitor your own symptoms for prolonged stress and sadness. Fourth, and I need to really work on this one, take breaks from the news and social media. Make a regular habit of stepping away from your computer and smartphone from time to time. If you're like me, you have found yourself sitting at your computer still for so long that the automatic lights in your office turn off. And fifth, be fortified by remembering the importance and meaning of your work. Next slide, please. Our AMA has created a number of tools and resources to help physicians manage their mental health and cope with stress in this pandemic. Many of these tools, in addition to our daily COVID-19 videos and our podcast series, are available for free in the AMA COVID-19 Resource Center on our website, ama-assn.org. Our mental health resources page provides specific recommendations on how physicians can manage their stress, how we can take care of ourselves, our staff, and our patients during the pandemic. The AMA's Guide for Caring for Our Caregivers helps health system leaders support physicians and care teams in this challenging environment. This guide provides practical examples and strategies to encourage wellness and improve physician satisfaction. It also includes valuable strategies that address workload redistribution, institutional policies, meals, childcare, attention to emotional and physical well being, and, and connecting with others. We must always remember that burnout is not a moral weakness or a personal failing. It is first and foremost a systems issue. We also have some strategies to prioritize mental health during the winter months and related efforts to reduce physician and provider burnout and promote wellness. 
The AMA website now has an education hub, the Ed Hub, as we call it, which is an online education portal. And it includes dozens of modules around phys physician health and wellness, including support for physicians to recognize and respond to suicidal ideation among their peers, their patients, and other members of the healthcare team. And of course, we continue to work at the highest levels to help secure the PPE that physicians and caregivers need and for the financial support to help independent practices overcome the economic hardships of COVID-19. We have helped secure more than $180 billion to support physicians and other frontline healthcare personnel in the Federal CARES Act and supplemental funding packages since the start of the pandemic. And we continue to work at the federal and state levels to reduce and eliminate major sources of burnout, the administrative hassles and burdens that steal time from our days and our patients. Next slide. So in closing, our physician community and our healthcare community has been through a lot in the past year. We've weathered many storms and we'll need to weather many more before we can truly put this pandemic behind us. But I'm confident that we'll get through this health crisis as we have done so many others in the past by drawing on the strength and support of our wonderful colleagues and with the help and support of organized medicine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bailey. That was an uh, excellent overview of um, sort of framing the discussion for us and, and giving us uh, some excellent resources from the AMA to try to combat it. Uh, next, we'll hear from Dr. Summers uh, some ideas of how we tame this, uh, strategies to mitigate or, or manage the burnout and depression that uh, many physicians and caregivers are experiencing. Dr. Summers? Thank you, Kimberly, and um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all this afternoon and an honor to be part of this very distinguished panel and to follow such inspiring remarks uh, by uh, the, the two prior panelists. Um, so I do, um, in terms of disclosures, I do get some royalties uh, from the American Psychiatric Publishing uh, for um, a book on burnout. Uh, first slide, please. So um, this is the state of the art pre-COVID in terms of interventions for burnout. Um, as each of our panelists have reminded us, burnout is really the response of an individual to an overwhelmingly stressful system. So the most effective interventions are systemic interventions. So in this um, 2017 article, which I think summarizes it so well, the interventions really looked at trying to change the organization, the healthcare organizations to promote autonomy, decrease moral injury, for leaders to engage in a participata participatory management style in working with colleagues, the importance of social cohesion the community of physicians, the community of healthcare workers, um, the importance in our current uh, healthcare system of really looking at the sort of the pebbles in the shoe, the things that drive us crazy every day that are frustrating and inefficient, trying to decrease those, and then looking at preventable patient harm, um, uh, patient medical errors, and really supporting healthcare workers who are in situations where some of those errors occur. And then really lastly is sort of wellness interventions on an individual level. So this is really state of the art pre-COVID. Next slide, please. And if you could click one more, I think it'll bring up something on the right. Right, so this is my sort of summary. Um, you know, in the work that I've done with individuals groups and systems related to well-being. This is kind of the summary uh, that I've created of sort of the low-hanging fruit. What can you do most easily to enhance the well-being of the individuals in your system? Well, on the level of the system, it's really setting up accessible mental health services and instituting appropriate parental and family leave policies. 
It's something that can be done on a system-wide level. We know that many of the healthcare workers that are most stressed, the stress is in relation to the conflict or the balance between work and home. And especially disproportionately on many younger healthcare workers, also individuals taking care of older relatives. So parental and family leave can be very helpful along with accessible mental health services. The other level of intervention is sort of uh, on a lower level in the org chart of an organization at the level of departments, clinics, programs. And this is a kind of QI style setting up of committees and conversations to look at those things that can be done in a very local way simple, collaborative, iterative conversations about things that can improve the workflow, make it less frustrating, more respectful of physician autonomy, have physicians more involved in decision-making, and the kinds of things that were mentioned um, in the previous slide. Next slide, please. And, uh, next slide. The other thing I'd like to just mention is that uh, diversity and inclusion uh, is not just the right thing to do in healthcare systems. And it's not just something that improves the overall effectiveness of the system and helps us meet our mission and our objectives. But also it turns out that it has the potential to enhance well-being. There's a fascinating study from 2019 looking at health, house staff across the country. And what they essentially found was those internship classes with a higher proportion of physicians who are underrepresented in medicine seem to have a, um, a better well being, and that is less increase in depression scores over the course of the internship. So, diversity and inclusion looks like it may be associated with enhanced well being for the entire group of physicians. And I think that's something very important for us to be thinking about. Next slide. Um, so here comes COVID. Um, next slide, please. And um, this is a reminder of the National Academy of Medicine's initiative focusing on well being and especially in the setting of COVID and the contribution of the families, family members of Lorna Breen, um, who was a distinguished New York physician um, who. Um, uh, whose family is quite committed to uh, promoting well-being among uh, physicians, especially as it relates to COVID and the stresses of COVID. Next slide, please. And of course, as our colleagues have mentioned, the headlines have been everywhere. We've taken a situation in which we have all, our profession has been struggling with burnout and things have been accelerated and much worse by many of the kinds of stresses and strains that my colleagues have mentioned. Next slide. A couple of other things to just remind us of since we're looking at systemic solutions to a systemic problem that some of the stresses and changes to the system unfortunately are making it more difficult for us to um, implement some of the changes we'd like to make. And I wanna review a couple of these sort of broader systemic things that have happened. 8% um, of physicians have closed their practices as a result of COVID. Next slide. The majority of physicians believe that the wise, widespread use of telemedicine is not gonna continue unless reimbursement rates change. Next slide. The majority of physicians, 59% agree that COVID is gonna lead to a reduction in the number of independent physician practices in their communities. And about 50% think that hospitals are going to be exerting a stronger influence over the organization and delivery of healthcare as a result of the pandemic. So the COVID is not just affecting physicians on an individual level, it's promoting change in the system, which is also going to have an impact on the well being of physicians. Next slide. So this is the first and the, the, uh, the JAMA article looking at the impact of COVID on healthcare workers uh, in China, in Wuhan. Next slide. And this is the sort of summary, which essentially reminds us that in the setting, in the worst of the pandemic, that um, 
many healthcare workers experience substantial psychological burdens and that it seemed to be especially among nurses and among women healthcare workers, those in Wuhan sort of closest to the epicenter and those who are frontline um, in working for co with COVID patients. Next slide. This is just a reminder of the notion of moral injury, which again, my colleagues have mentioned, but I think is particularly poignant uh, for healthcare workers uh, working in the setting of COVID. Part of what is so painful and difficult and really creates a wound which is quite long lasting are the, the difficulty when you're not able to deliver the kind of care that you believe is appropriate to individuals because of the limitations of the workplace, because of the limitations of the system. Next slide. COVID-19 and families, really the groups that are probably most affected are uh, families, often mothers more than fathers, um, those with young children struggling with the balancing childcare and school, um, these are individuals who are at high risk already. And I think, as I mentioned before, probably also individuals who are involved in caring for ill relatives or older relatives. They're already stressed. They were stressed pre-COVID and even more so now. Next slide. So the personal interventions for burnout, I think have been mentioned and are so, are so important to, to look at healthy habits related to exercise, diet, mindfulness, lifestyle interventions, the importance of support, connection, family, community. Um, for burnout, changing work conditions is really quite important. Um, it's not just building up individual resilience. If we really believe that burnout is the response of an individual to an overly stressful workplace, they've got to either help promote change in that workplace or change their workplace. May also involve getting individual level consultation and treatment. Next slide. Really looking at um, a healing environment and whether that's on the personal side or to the extent that it can be um, expressed on the professional side. Family, friends, time to grieve and process traumatic deaths. Um, administrative support for the recognition of what everybody's been through, time for appropriate debriefing, reaching out by peers, appropriate limitations of work hours, time off when necessary, especially during particularly acutely stressful work times, avoidance of drug and alcohol abuse. Uh, next slide. Some remarkably innovative programs have been developed in the setting of COVID. And I just had the opportunity to moderate a panel. And these were four healthcare systems that had in the setting of COVID um, either enhanced or completely transformed their systems for peer support and consultation and referral for their physician um, uh, and, and, and healthcare staff. As you can see, some have developed innovative apps where you can go online, you can assess yourself and you can plug in directly for group um, groups to participate in, individual appointments. Um, some are more old style where you have an individual conversation and triage, but each of these systems um, has developed a kind of way for um, uh, healthcare workers to work at, to reach out in a relatively anonymous way to accept, uh, access resources. Next slide, and I think this is my final slide, and really a reminder of some of the organizational and social factors, sort of the kind of broader systemic leadership interventions that can help promote well being for healthcare workers. Um, appropriate training um, throughout this pandemic and continuing, appropriate equipment, attention paid to supporting and maintaining genuine camaraderie and connection among healthcare workers, honest, genuine, transparent communication, effective preparation, sort of education about what everybody's going through 
and normalizing and supporting the reactions of normal people to extreme situations, the kinds of support systems that I just mentioned, which are very different in different healthcare systems as is probably appropriate, and always a, a reminder that in the midst of this crisis, uh, we also need to think about the future and think about what we're learning from this crisis, how we can all grow, how we can change our system, we can change ourselves to promote a better future for our patients and for ourselves. So thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Look forward to being part of the Q&A. Well, thank you so, so much um, uh, to each of our speakers. Really, truly phenomenal uh, talks that we've heard today. Um, thank you for helping us to uh, name it, frame it, and giving us some really concrete suggestions for taming it. Uh, I, I particularly appreciate the themes of um, systemic and moral injuries, and as well, um, Dr. Summers, uh, and, and all just uh, your, your emphasis on diversity in our midst. So uh, truly, thank you. Um, we're going we're gonna, to uh, move on to uh, putting some questions to our panelists. And so, um, you know, just to extend some of the data that has uh, emerged out of the pandemic, I'd like to uh, invite um, Dr. Uh, Abdallah, uh, to uh, discuss a little bit about one of the earliest and largest studies that uh, assess the impact of COVID-19 on the, on the pandemic uh, amongst healthcare workers. If you could, uh, this will be a two-part question for you. Tell us a little bit about the background and your findings. And then the second part would be um, one year later, uh, is there any difference? Is the mental health crisis any better? Yeah, well, thank you again for inviting me. Um, and uh, I, I will discuss this, this study. So I'm actually a, an, an cardiologist and intensive care unit physician at Columbia University. So um, in New York City. So we were definitely one of the first places to, to deal uh, with the ep uh, pandemic. And it was one of the world's um, largest epicenters, as you know. It's really in this milieu, I was actually on service the very first week uh, that the pandemic started in, in New York City. And that's really the impetus behind how we even developed this uh, very quickly and launched it uh, in the beginning of April. And as you know, um, uh, one, of my, uh, one of our colleagues, Dr. Laura Breen, um, uh, died subsequently in, uh, in April uh, at the end. So this is one of the reasons that I think Columbia University in particular has been wanting to um, really focus the discussion. And so part of that really came out of the study um, where we looked at uh, individuals, we enrolled more than 1200 nurses, physicians, advanced practice providers, as well as house staff and fellows. And what we found was that, um, and what we published uh, subsequently was that 50% of our staff were experiencing acute stress. And as, as you all know, that if left untreated, can potentially uh, develop into post-traumatic stress disorder after at least one month of symptoms. And um, we also found that almost half had depressive symptoms and a third had anxiety and more than 70% had insomnia symptoms, which I think is, is going to be another uh, issue that we really need to be um, progressive about and think uh, more broadly about uh, that, that than uh, we have been. Um, those that were most at risk were our nurses, and for each psychological measure, a higher percent of nurses screened positive versus attending physicians, and that really highlights the idea that the frontline provider and the healthcare worker is going to be most at risk. I think even before the pandemic, we sort of knew that. We knew that emergency department physicians and ICU physicians tend to have high rates of burnout, um, but I think really in the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we really need to discuss uh, that the fact that our, our nurses in particular are, are facing this, um, and really, uh, this is this is a this is a problem. Uh, it's obviously not was not unique to New York City healthcare workers. Dr. Summers um, mentioned uh, the uh, study published by Lyadile from uh, uh, China was one of the first um, that to mention this, and uh, we were one of the, the first in, in the U.S. to document it. Um, and subsequent to that, several studies have have also continued to to document this. I do think, um, you know, you know, when we assessed uh, our own um, uh, participants, we did ask, you know, what did they want for their own well-being, and what were their resources that uh, they were currently using. Uh, and I think we can frame, uh, you know, that conversation in a little bit uh, that there is going to be diversity of what people need, depending on probably where they started, even pre-pandemic, as well as how Dr. Bailey had mentioned that there are certain unique. 
issues with the COVID-19 pandemic with regards to stress to families, right? Uh, if you're already a caregiver, especially with young kids or even, and, you know, for elderly, you know, you're going to experience the issues of the COVID-19 pandemic a little bit separately uh, and differently. Um, you know, one year le later, uh, you know, I, I actually, unfortunately, I think the mental health is getting worse. As we go through subsequent waves of the COVID-19 pandemic, there is this feeling of just uh, you know, uh, there's a burnout about the pandemic, right? Let's let's name that, all right? <laughs> Is that people are becoming, uh, I think, a little bit even uh, uh, less engaged about the conversation, and that's a problem. I think you're also going to find that the next pandemic, which is related to this, is that people have started to leave their jobs, right? And healthcare workers, as we know, are not replaceable. There is a long term in terms of being able to replace this. And if our nurses are the ones who are experiencing the, the brunt of it, um, then we're really going to have another healthcare crisis that, uh, if there's any other stress to the, the system, is going to be a problem. Thank you, Marwa. That's um, really outstanding work that you've done. Um, a, a bit depressing uh, to know that we're not getting better uh, in all of this, um, but, but I appreciate the work that you're doing. It's important contribution for all of us. Um, Dr. McLean, there was a, 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 a really outstanding question that came through the chat, um, really asking about how you advise physicians or healthcare providers with burnout to talk to their bosses and their leaders uh, when they feel some of the solutions need, you know, their leaders to make some changes, but they may fear retaliation or being labeled as being burned out, um, and which may, you know, marginalize uh, them. Or and. This person asks that this can be potentially a greater issue for women uh, than for men if they're labeled as complainers. What, what do you advise people? So I'm going to start and uh, you know, offer that anyone else can join in and, and respond to that as well. But just a couple of ideas. Um, I think one of the most important things that you can do is really think about what you want to say before you have that conversation um, to, to use probably... Uh, I have found, especially depending on who the leader is and how receptive they are, that an argument that includes data is usually an argument that's more effective than an, ar an argument that's just emotionally based. So knowing the data could be really very helpful. There's a lot of great data out there from Steve Swenson and Tate Shanafelt. Um, they, uh, out of Mayo, I think originally they they created this thing called the, the 12 question leadership index and found that if you could just move that leadership index by one point, that you would improve engagement and decrease burnout. So being able to show some of that data, I think could be really helpful. And then finally, I think offering to be part of the solution to work collaboratively within the department could also, I think, be helpful in um, not just posing, you know, hey, this is the problem, you fix it, but offering really to work with that leader to find the solutions together would be one way to approach it. Yeah, thank you. I, um, I wanted to expand a little bit on that and perhaps uh, ask Nora and then Marwan to, to comment. So both of you are leaders in organizations and departments and divisions and um, how are you balancing the burnout that we know all of the people that you have in your department division are experiencing versus the demands of the hospital system to see more patients, uh, recoup the finances? You know, how do you balance those two things uh, in your organization? First, maybe Nora and then Marwan. Well, I, I think this is, you know, we're just starting to sort of look at that we know where we are after a year of COVID and, you know, a lot of health systems, it's not looking great financially. So we're sort of feeling that pressure, but, but I think there's also an understanding this is an incredibly unusual time. And so I also think there's some recognition of, you know, uh, the usual metrics may not hold. Uh, but I, I think that, um, 
I feel first and foremost, we have to sort of make sure that we are thinking about how we're delivering care, kind of get back to our basics, right? Of, of doing care, doing it in a way that we feel is high value. Um, you know, thinking about, yes, our efficiencies, but really getting back to like delivering care because we've had a very unusual year of how we deliver care. And I think we've been a little disconnected. And as physician that's at our core is, is that relationship. And I think working to kind of make make the physicians feel like they're doing a good job with the care they're delivering. We're getting back to sort of our core values as physicians. I think that if that's there, then I feel like we can build on that towards like our efficiencies and getting our volumes up to the catcher. But I really want to hone in on the things that I think as physicians really kind of ground us and make, you know, us see our value in the work that we're doing. So I'm really focusing mostly on that sort of telling the leadership of the hospital. They just have to wait while we get this together. Yeah. It's my approach. That's important. Um, Marwan, what about you? Yeah, sure. You know, in, in my space, uh, I would divide it into three areas. The first area is I'm a transplant surgeon. We work odd hours and uh, we have to work as a team. Uh, surgeons, physicians, uh, nurses, recovery teams, OPO teams and all that. So we have to have our finger on the pulse and we have to have reasonable call systems. We have to have backup systems and we also need to feel when too much is too much. And then when there is adverse events or bad encounters and when somebody's fatiguing, you need to have those uh, radars and the, uh, you know, the sense of awareness that something is not right with your team. So you have a mortality. I came in a few days ago and there was an intraoperative mortality. You come in, you assist, you provide support. You Then you provide a venue to debrief. Uh, you make sure everybody's okay. Uh, you validate that their skills and so on and so forth. And you allow people to lean on you. And then you point them to system resources and external resources that they can tap into. So I think the personal role and the team camaraderie and support systems have to be there. And I invest a lot in my team's education, whether it's mindfulness, appreciative inquiry, positivity, dealing with stress and how to have these crucial conversations and what proper language is and conversational intelligence and all that. Now, at the, at the mid leadership to higher leadership, when I chaired the board and all that, our commitment was, we need to have something in place that people can reach out to and then speak with someone and have somebody committed to this full time. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, <laughs> and have a team that supports Lisa because Lisa can get crushed doing that as well. So we needed to commit to doing that. If you don't commit, it's not gonna happen. And within that scale, coach all the chairs in the leadership styles that are conducive to well-being in a department, the new way of doing business. None of this hardy thing, you chose medicine, get crushed, it's part of the job. Nope, can't do that. Uh, mortality, morbidity, moral injury every time, and so on and so forth, given feedback. At the higher level, and I've expressed it to the system CEO, we need to have funding. We need to have accountability exactly the same way you structure for the hospital. If you say I'm going to build the hospital in the Northeast, and I say, Okay, well, then build a wellness center for your staff. This is just the same investment. And the ROI, let me give you that list. Finances, opportunity loss, rehiring, recruitment, recruitment ability, retention, and on and on and on. And how it trickles into the halo of your own organization. As a leader, when one person pops, everybody around you goes, I'm in the wrong place. I'm out of here. So I think it has to be all these tiers, Kim. And I can elaborate on each one a little bit more if you want. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. That's, that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. That, that was really phenomenal. Um, we are very close to our time here, but maybe in the last couple of minutes, uh, you know, in addition to what was just said about systemic changes, uh, this concept of moral injury, um, I'm going to point this towards Dr. Bailey. Um, the AMA has a lot of oversight over, I think you said, near a quarter of a million uh, physicians. And, and I wonder from um, that perspective and maybe even on the policy levels and then down to our levels at our own institutions, if you had any uh, quick recommendations for us that we could take back to our institutions to address some of these things. Well, well thanks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, first of all, uh, the, the destigmatization of um, pursuing uh, mental health help um, is so incredibly important. And the licensure issue that I mentioned very briefly, uh, one thing that we're advocating AMA policy, trying to get to all you know 50 states, 
is for them to stop asking questions on your license renewal uh, if you have sought help for mental health issues in the past year. Um, because, you know, to me, that's a good sign and not a bad sign, but um, it can jeopardize your license. And that's just that talk about a disincentive to um, to seek care or just to out and out lie, both of which are are not great ethical standards. Um, we also the the system issue uh, that Marwan just discussed. I, I think it's so important to remember that burnout is expensive. If you if a hospital loses one physician, it's probably going to be about a million dollars uh, in terms of hire, recruitment and hiring and and you know temporary workers and things like that. So if a if a system doesn't respond to anything else just remind them how expensive it is to, to try to replace a physician. And, um, but the, the understanding that you don't need yoga classes, you know, help for uh, individuals, the flexibility I think is incredibly important, but there, there are, you know, individual, um, um, you know, resources available, but, um, you know, the, the AMA has also been working with, um, practices across the country to try to actually get some data about what works and what doesn't work in a more of a practice setting uh, because you know data uh, peer-reviewed data has much more of an influence on policymakers than our anecdotes although stories are very important um, you know data can turn you know what it is perceived by some people as whining into something that's actually actionable. Thank you so much, Dr. Bailey. That's really helpful. What I'm hearing from many of our speakers is data and, and money drives that conversation, doesn't it? And so, um, you know, thank you to all of you who are doing the important work here. Dr. Summers, you described some of that. Um, I'd like to know your perspective. Uh, this concept of moral injury has come up several times. And I was, I was told by our, our staff here that we have a few extra minutes, so we're going to keep going because this is just such a rich conversation. Can you speak to uh, moral injury a little bit for us and, and help us to understand that a little bit more and how we might address that? Sure. But if I may, before I do, I just would love to pile on for a moment to the two the comments from the two previous speakers. So, you know, um, we are all in this together. That's healthcare workers, healthcare leadership, and patients, and the American public. We all we we have a big problem, um, and we all need to work together. And you know, I think that we can listen to the um, really important data that Dr. Abdallah told us about, and you can react um, and say that it's worrisome and, and depressing, and that's true in a way, but really it's a call to action. And I think that to me, when individuals wanna speak up, I encourage them to speak up, not as individuals, but in the context of something much larger. So it's, I have an issue in my clinic, in my day with what I'm feeling, but I know that this is part of something that many people are struggling with, in this clinic, in this department, in this healthcare system. And the more you put it in that context and in the context of what, honestly, there's not a healthcare leader in America that isn't really worried about physician well being and healthcare worker well being. People get it. It's not that they're, you know, they're unaware. I think that um, it's sometimes hard to find the resources, it's hard to galvanize organizations, et cetera. But I do think that one thing we have all been very successful in doing is calling attention to this problem and creating a space for people to have conversations and to try to figure out solutions. So uh, I think that's a, a broad comment. I think just more specifically, just about moral injury, I think it really speaks to the ethical soul of physicians and often what inspired us all into the work to do the work that we're doing. And we all want to do it in the way that we feel it most ought to be done in terms of our own ethical standards with sensitivity and awareness to our patients' needs. It's hard because we cannot always do that. We've known that, but I think COVID has stressed us even further. And there have been moments for many physicians where quite frankly, they've been put not just outside of their comfort zone, but really outside of a zone that anybody should be in. That's what moral injury is. 
And when that happens, that's a whole other more complicated process, I think, for somebody to really recover from. So thank you. Great. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Um, for anybody else on the panel, Dr. McLean, uh, I would love to hear your, your perspective on these things as well. Um, so in terms of moral injury, um, I couldn't agree more with what, you know, others on the panel have said. I, I really can't add any, any more to what they, what they, I think, so eloquently described. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Did, was there somebody else who was yeah. uh, coming up there? Ryan, before we close, I just want to say one thing here is that we are living in a system that was designed for us, not by us. We need to get into systems designed. We are living in an environment that keeps getting designed and we're told what to do. And there is no budgeting of people. So you budget manpower, and, but you don't budget impact on well-being. You don't budget the outcome of bad decisions into your equation. You don't budget any of this. So that's why I said leadership accountability and thinking systems design with the impact on the workforce and everything you do, you will get the insights. Very much like now we have diversity officers in our system. What is the impact of your decision on diversity? But what is the impact of your decision on the well-being of your staff and faculty? We need to have that. Great, thank you so much. I couldn't agree more. And uh, kudos to your institution for uh, Dr. McLean and her efforts. I know that's uh, increasingly popular. So that's really fantastic. Um, uh, back to uh, Dr. Bailey, you would, uh, and you know, we'll, we'll transition a little bit because uh, one of the things we'd like our audience members to be able to take away is uh, what we've deemed a toolkit. And so um, uh, 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 attendees and anybody for that matter can go onto the AASLD website. Uh, that'll be linked out uh, adjacent to uh, the webinar itself. And there'll be a collection of resources. But Dr. Bailey, um, you know, you drew on this idea uh, and, and really helpful framework in how to recognize burnout in our colleagues. And I'm wondering if you could, uh, if I were to recognize it in a colleague, is there one or two resources that you might point me to to really help plug in that colleague if, if I have a concern for them? You know, I think, first of all, um, knowing if there are resources available in your community uh, for a colleague to uh, get, um, you know, help with their mental health. Uh, there are some county medical societies around the country that have arranged for, you know, confidential, you know, counseling services for physicians, um, you know, during the pandemic uh, to enable them to, to, to get the help that they need. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not sure I would approach anybody without, um, uh, of course, just, you know, uh, knowing that someone has someone that they can talk to and, and someone that they can lean on is, is worth, you know, is worth an incredible amount, but also being able to offer solutions um, because most of us are not mental health professionals. And, uh, but if there's somebody that you trust, if there's somebody that, if a resource that you can give them, you know, our organizations often have, you know, tips and so, but sometimes somebody, a seminar or, um, you know, a CME, you know, session is not going to be enough. They really need somebody to talk to. And, um, you know, learning yourself about the resources that are available in your own community can be very helpful. Great, thank you. No, nothing replaces that individual uh, relationship, does it? Uh, no institution, no app or any other systemic thing per se, as much as just being there and being supportive. And maybe sometimes it's just being an ear to listen to and pointing them in the right direction. So that's really excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so we're drawing close to the end of our time here. And, you know, I just really, uh, I've been struck and, and sobered. Um, I'm grateful for having had the opportunity to participate in a survey that we've recently uh, submitted um, or rather receiving data back from our own membership here in AASLD and some very sobering and heavy comments that we've seen. And um, I think that, you know, while we've had such a great diversity across the board, this is, this is at home for us as hepatologists. And so um, I look forward to sharing that data with our membership. Uh, thank you so much for everybody who's been here. Uh, we will soon uh, have that data out to you in the, in the coming months. So please be looking for um, hopefully a publication forthcoming uh, in the coming months in that regard. Uh, as you see on the screen there, 
Uh, we have uh, included links from each of the respective societies for each of our, our speakers and our panelists. So thank you to them for offering those up. And as well, I'd point the attention of our audience towards the toolkit. Again, that can be found on the AASLD website uh, near the, the place where you uh, registered for the webinar itself. So with that, uh, once again, just uh, on behalf of AASLD, um, our, my co-moderators, uh, I'd just like to give my deepest gratitude to all of our uh, speakers uh, for giving us phenomenal insights, suggestions, recommendations, presenting us with powerful data, and for our panelists to really help bring those things home. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we'd love to continue this conversation, so please do reach out to us. Uh, we want to be a resource, AASLD. Uh, seeks to be a resource for our membership and anybody else that we can be helpful to. So thank you all so much. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you so much.